that one. We talked about the three uh, separates that make up our soil, sand, silt, and clay, and the sizes of each one of those. Um, some of the things that they're important for, water holding capacity. Y'all remember that when we sprayed water in the sand, it didn't take much, and when we sprayed it in the clay, it took a lot more. Um, cation exchange based upon our surface area, organic matter, and land usage. Uh, we went over some of the other um, the influences of surface area, water retention again, nutrient retention, um, rate of weathering and charge and microbial activity. Remember I made the example where the Mississippi starts way up in Minnesota and picks up all that soil, the banks overflow. The thing that the, the separate that settles out first is the sand, A, because it's bigger. It has a, the diameter of the particle is bigger, it's the biggest one. It's also heavier. So if you remember back from total pore space and bulk density, technically the bulk density of one single grain of sand is probably really close to 2.65 grams per cubic centimeter. That's very heavy. There's no, there's no buoyancy of it. it. It's the first thing to settle out. And so as we move into silt, so as the water continues to go, the silt settles out next. And then finally, as the water makes it as far as it can go and finally settles down, typically through evaporation, the clay will be left. And so the further you get away from a riverbank, the more likely you are to have a clayey soil. That girl looks way too excited to be doing the hydrometer method. Uh, remember we did our textural triangle, sand, silt, and clay, 50% sand, 30% clay, we know we have a loam, and just to finish it out, we'll come across with 20% or, what did I say? 50% sand, 30% silt, 20% clay. We'll come across with 60% sand, 15% silt, right there in the middle we have a sandy clay loam. I think we made it to getting into uh, the structure where we had the spheroidal kind of the, the, the top soil where the roots have grown. Um, if, you, if you can find the right type of soil at the right moisture content, you run your rototiller through it, it breaks up into this just beautiful soil powder. You kind of, you can pick it up and you can still break some of the rocks. And, and you know that you're gonna have good pore space. You're gonna have good water infiltration um, and you're going to have good root growth. And those are going to be three things that you're going to need in order to grow your plants very well. Platy, remember I said that we have a platy soil and the water that falls on the top here must travel left and right in order to infiltrate into the soil. As it becomes more compacted, we start to get more platy structures. We had blocky, angular blocky and subangular blocky. Um, these are going to be more of like your shrink swell clays, um, what we would call dirt clods. I hate to use dirt, I don't like to, but that's the best way I know it. They're just the dirt clods out there, and they're really hard to break up. Um, and once they're in that clod, you really have to almost break that down to a fine powder, or at least to a something that looks similar to this, before you can really grow anything in that. A plant is not going to want to grow in a dense, compacted, clay, blocky soil. The thing to remember about columnar um, soil structures is that they're going to have that salt cap on the top, and we're typically going to find this in arid climate. And the reason that they have that salt cap is that um, the groundwater contains sodium of some sort or maybe potassium, depending on, uh, depending on the region, uh, the great Salt Lake City of Utah, because their water and the soils around them are very salty. And so the irrigation water is applied over the top, the water evaporates and leaves the salt. Or you might have the water table come up from the bottom carrying the salts with it through capillary rise 
And when it makes it up there, eventually the water either moves back down, the salts are attracted to the soil, or the water evaporates. And so in salty um, climates like that, we'll have a columnar soil structure. Uh, prismatic being found in our lower horizons, um, similar to columnar, it might have sort of, well, as we would have a column uh, that looks more like this. Columnar. Oh, okay. So someone probably wasn't looking at that. That's probably for a picture of that. Um, prismatic would have more of like a triangular shape to it. And that's what's going to separate those two. And y'all, we've already been over most of this, haven't we? Y'all remember this from lab? What is the particle density? Two point six five rank per cubic centimeter. That piece of sand. Two point six five rank per cubic centimeter. There's no pore space there. Remember our bulk density. We're going to take the, the mass of the oven dried soil. So we take the sample, put it in the oven, dry it. Whatever is left is just the mineral and pore space. We've taken out the water, so the only thing left is the mineral and the pore space. And if you read over the handout, pore space is going to affect bulk density because bulk density affects pore space. So more pore space, less bulk density, or lower bulk density. If you increase the bulk density, what are we doing? We're putting more soil in us. Well, it's like putting five pounds or 10 pounds in a five pound bag, right? You don't got to cram that in there. So you're taking up the pore space out of there. Organic matter. And organic matter influences it because uh, that is going to give us some, our, some of our aggregate structure. And it's also going to bring water holding capacity and it is going to take up some space, but it's not really mineral. So organic matter is not mineral, as in if you think about like, like bones being mineral. In soils, there's a mineral structure there. But in organic matter, it's not. It's the decaying plant material. And most of our plant material is water and carbohydrates and some other protein structures and some starches but it's not mineral like it's not solid so that is going to influence some of that pore space as well texture sand silt and clay so soils with more clay are going to have typically lower bulk densities I mean, it might not sound like that because you would think that if with a smaller particle size you could actually fit more into a little ring, but actually because of that small size of the charge and everything that goes along with it, you actually have more micro pore space. So we have macro pores which are large. If you were to put two sand particles together or a handful of sand and think about that, they don't necessarily sit stacked right one on perfectly on top of each other. They're going to have, they're going to be a little irregularly, kind of randomly put in there. There's going to be a little bit of pore space in there. And the tough thing about determining like macro pore and micro pore, because they're both really small, but when we get down to that layer, when we get down to that level of millimeters, we still have to uh, think about them in size. And so macro pores, if you have a bunch of sand particles, the pore spaces are going to be bigger. But if you have some very thin, small, less than 0.2, millim 0.02 millimeter, think about that, how small that is. That's a silty kind of, there's still pore space in there. And there's more of them that eventually equal out to be more than the macro pore space of a sandy soil. Also, that a sandy soil is going to have uh, a greater particle density. So they weigh more inside there. And since we have more pore space, we can kind of fit more in there. And then finally, depth and profile. And this makes sense, right? 
because the 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 very top part of the soil not a whole lot of weight is on that until we drive over it with a tractor but also remember that when we did the mass of an acre furrow slice and we take six inches worth of depth and put that on the scale remember that was about two million pounds and so now you have two million pounds of this top six inches pushing down on the six inches below it and then you drive a tractor over that and so now you put more pressure and so as you continue down in depth there's some more pressure and some more weight and some more compaction and when we get into module two you'll find that in soil formation forms from the bottom up and so the bedrock has a bulk density of 2.65 grams per cubic centimeter there's no pore space in there and so as soil forms and gets compacted eventually the weight of that compacts that and the bulk density and the B depth is more likely to be greater than the bulk density in the A depth so depth and profile is going to affect affect bulk density as well so we had 2.65 grams per cubic centimeter the pie chart the pore space being air and water and then the minerals and so I remember I showed you in lab that as we increase bulk density we increase the mineral content of this whole pie so that it starts to take up some of this pore space and now we only have let's say 40% pore space to balance between air and water which is going to decrease our water holding capacity it's going to decrease the amount of gas that's flowing in and out of our soils because it's going to whatever water does get in it's going to hold that more and now we don't have any oxygen and now our plants don't grow and they're dead now and because the land manager did not take that into consideration we might need to find a new land manager thank you for your time we'll need your letter of resignation you're fine <laughs> just got this job so understanding that is going to help you in your as you begin to manage land or begin to work with other land managers i know we have a lot of tag business in here and so it's tough for me to make that in between but as you begin to work with other land managers that might be something that you ask hey what's the bulk density maybe we're missing something here oh it's compacted well that's why the plants aren't growing or you know that the soil type is a really sandy loam they're trying to grow rice i don't think we're gonna uh i don't think we're gonna ensure your crop because what you're trying to do doesn't work i'm sorry but your loan's been denied well, that's not a good business venture for me to to get involved with did everyone do okay on the calculation assignment like like the quiz in there did y'all like that that you get to go back in and redo that cool i'm glad that worked out um, so we're going to work a little bit more to make sure that you're prepared for the test on Sunday. So if we have a bulk density of 1.28, the first thing we need to do is solve the parentheses, right? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. And so we find that that percentage is 0.483. Next, we're going to subtract that from 1. And then we'll, excuse me, multiply by 100, 51.7%. I know y'all remember doing this and then you had to go back and redo it again it just so happens that the way that the class is structured we would have went over this prior to um, I just wanted to get y'all started with math I'm going to be doing some more math today yay yay no um, 
But like I want to get y'all prepared to do that because as you continue on throughout your career, when you can do math, life becomes so much easier. And um, I don't make math difficult yet. Um, I want you to get comfortable doing that math. I had a student email me and say, hey, uh, I think I did this, I hope I did this right. This is really simple, maybe it's too easy. I'm making it that way. I want you to be able to understand the like, you know what, that's all the question was asking me to do was divide the range by cubic centimeters. There's no extra steps or else, I mean, this is your first math problem that you've done for me, so I want you to be comfortable doing that. And then there's a look at the overall formula. And so remember that when you're taking your test, your calculator, that you can do, you can do it this way, that we, take our bulk density and divide it by 2.65 grams per cubic centimeter and 0 0.483 minus 1 is still the same thing as 1 minus 0 0.43, right? And then you just have to multiply times 100 to remove the negative. But you can't have negative force there. Alright. Y'all go ahead and work those two problems right there. Now there's no like, oh, well, I, couldn't, I couldn't turn it in. No, you can take a picture and you can post that on Instagram if you want to and I can get into it. Or on Facebook or send it to my email or whatever. Like I'm, I'm fairly technologically advanced. Like I'm cool with that. Um, you still get to turn it in. Like that took away all the excuses of like, uh, left it somewhere. What's up? How many spaces do you want to round to? Just two. I mean, but it's not enough. You would only put two in there anyway. I know, I'm, I'm a stickler for decimal also, so.
Carpendal? Okay. Grayson. Grayson Cox. Cool. Stephen Douglas. Hey. <laughs> hey, Rosa. All right, everyone got this? Everyone good here? 31.32%. Y'all got pretty close. Again, remember, I also had a little bit of rounding error in there. So, like, if you had 31.4 or 31.2 or 1 or 29 point or 30.9, like, there's a little bit of error in there because of the way that we calculate our, the way we do our calculations. Because I don't, I, once I do that math of 182.182 divided by 2.65 and I get this big long decimal, I'm just going to subtract that from 1. And then I'm just going to multiply by 100. I mean, it might be different. So don't get too hung up that it wasn't the exact answer. Did you get in the ballpark? And then 49.43 for the other one. Anybody have any questions about this? Plus, why are you good? Okay, cool. Did I say that right? Cool. You want to make sure? I I grew up with a weird last name and people mess it up all the time, so. And so here, this is looking at how we form our, our, our aggregates, our macro aggregate being formed with uh, this root, and we have some fungi and some spores, um, some organic matter in there that is making this little micro aggregate that one sand particle with another sand particle with another sand particle eventually then snowballs out. Um, not so much that you would need to know this on a test or anything, but just to show you that this is how we kind of go from this macro aggregate made up of these two micro aggregates and how that starts. And then we finally have a primary particle of sand, silt, and clay that has some organic matter and some pore space. We've got a little pore space in there. There's a little bit of attraction around that. Um, silt particle that has some water attached to it as well. And so how this all really plays out is in uh, kind of how we manage the land for growing the crops and whether or not we need to till a lot or if we don't need to till, how that, how that structure sets up. Um, there's a big push for no-till agriculture these days because tilling opens up the soil to oxygen and then the carbon has been Combine with the oxygen and give it off as carbon dioxide. Now we're losing our organic matter, carbon dioxide sequestration, all this other stuff. In ag business, and this does relate to ag business, that there is going to be some, there's going to be some incentive for carbon credits. So when you go to look at your business plan or you're going to work with a producer that wants to do tillage, and you go, you know what, like if you kept that as no-till, we might be able to get you some extra money and you might be able to have this, this, this carbon credit that's added back to your farm and is now bringing a profit to you or it's not taking away a profit. So, um, something to be thinking about when we talk about carbon sequestration. Uh, any, any of y'all heard of Indigo Ag? Indigo Ag is a, um, is a, 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 a new ag company, duh, Indigo Ag. Um, in Memphis, it is really kind of pushing for the conservation and regenerative agriculture side and getting you some credits for planting cover crops, for doing no-till practices, for incorporating more organic matter, for uh, using regenerative agriculture. Not necessarily pushing for organic agriculture, but just that the agriculture is sustainable. And so no-till is a sustainable ag practice. And now you get, you get your degree and you go work for Indigo Ag and now you're working with building a budget plan for this producer and say, hey, you know what? I think what we're gonna do is put you back into a no-till or a conservation tillage system. We can save you a lot of money and sustainability here. So it does come back around. Um, our soil till is the physical condition of the soil in relation to plant growth, bulk density, structure, water retention, water movement, infiltration, permeability. 
is the structure and the building, if you think about it like that, is the building, which is the soil, suitable for roots to grow in. And it could go one way or the other. Now you could have a nice pore structure, a nice soil structure. We could have very compacted on one side, and then the roots can't grow in that. And then we have to till it, we tilt the wrong way. We head back over here, and now we've got that big, now we've got that blocky soil, and the roots can't grow in air either. So they can a little bit, but not a lot. So there has to be this root to soil contact. And we're trying to find that middle ground that our physical condition, just like the temperature, is right for plant root growth. Uh, not that you need to write all this stuff down. Not that you need to go crazy on your paper. But some of the things that you can do in order to manage your soil tilt is one is minimize tilt. It's kind of like rearranging your living room every day. Like eventually, like there's no consistency there. And then also you're taking up time and losing other things. Uh, try not to do anything when it's wet. Anybody work on a golf course? No? When I was a brand new, yeah, it was a long time ago, when I was in my associate's degree, uh, I went through a golf course for this tournament and New guy at the golf cart, and everyone loves driving a golf cart, and it's fun. And I was riding just a little bit off the cart path. And it was wet. And the superintendent came over and he said, Hey, now you're in turf grass. What do you think you're doing to that? What do you think you're doing to the soil right there when it's wet? It has the, the, the propensity, or the, it could possibly move. And then you compact that down. So wet soil compacts really easy. It was hard compacting that clay when it was dry. When you added water to it though, you could really kind of push that in and get all those pore spaces out. Uh, crop residues and compost are going to be for our microbial populations. Uh, we want to make sure that we have cover crops, um, some green manures, and then you can add gypsum to kind of alleviate some nutrient problems that you might have. Probably not going to be a test question. What's gypsum? Gypsum is um, calcium sulfate, or it's like lime. Oh. Yeah, kind of. But it's not calcium carbonate. It's yeah, uh, we use it on golf courses because we can't really change too much of the pH, but it will bind with some certain things. Um, when you go to pick up a handful of that soil, you can kind of gain some knowledge about it by taking a piece of it, putting it in between your fingers and squeezing it. I like we did with the ribbon test that whether or not that crumbles. So the sand that we did in the lab, when you dropped it on the table, what happened? It didn't have the consistency. It broke apart very easy. It would have broken apart very easy in your hand, but we were being nice and soft with it, right? Because we wanted to get the ball, because we were trying to accomplish some task so we could get out of the lab. <laughs> but when we dropped it, it didn't have any resistance to the impact on the table. But when we did it with our, with our clay ball, it just dropped and it stopped, but it remained in a ball. So the consistency of the clay is going to be much greater than the consistency of the sand. Consistency is when we actually had it in our hand and we were manipulating it. Again, the sand ball didn't have any consistency. We could, it, it didn't stick, it, it deformed very easily. The clay though, I actually, had to, I actually had to use my forearm muscles and kind of manipulate that, form that into the ball in order to be able to do the texture by people. Having more than 15% clay content, so going back to the textural triangle, having more than 15% clay content is what's going to hold your soil together. And that's because uh, 
there's going to be an attraction of water and it's going to fill up that pore space and we can get some hydrogen bonding, some cohesion and some adhesion that sucks that clay together and makes it stick now. Because before when it was dry, it didn't stick. None of the soils did. It wasn't until we added water that it was activated, if you can think about it like that. When the clay is dry, the sand is dry, you can't tell the difference between either one of them. But when you add the water, then you can tell the difference. Now, it was activated. And we can tell that the sand didn't have much consistence or consistency, and the clay did. For engineering, um, probably more so for uh, civil engineering. So, well, who was I talking to civil engineering? Jacob? Civil engineering probably would use this part of uh, the soil properties, uh, whether or not it's uh, collapsible. Um, if you were to go into uh, be a soil scientist, uh, which is probably typically my fall semester, um, they would end up doing compression tests and proctors tests. And then what it is, is it's just a different set of pressure um, or compression to determine the consistency and the consistency of that soil. And then finally, Adamsburg limits, primarily you might, maybe, maybe, run into this coefficient of linear liner extensibility. That should just not be liner, should not be in there. Um, anyhow, the length of it moist versus the length of it dry. So again, we have back to our, to our soils, and if we were to add the water to it and make our ribbon, we could stretch that ribbon And if you ever have to run into that, there is a chart that will tell you what different soil types and soil classification systems. Uh, this is really just that you were introduced to it. So in case someone says, wait a minute, you never, you never even heard of the unified soil classification system? You can at least say, yeah, we went over it soils briefly. Other than, yeah, no, I never heard of that before. Um, we also did this in lab where we did the, the hue, value, and chroma of our soils. So hue being uh, the wavelength of light, whether it's yellow, red, yellow, or green. Value being how light or dark it is. And then the chroma being the purity of the color. Not that we'll be doing much part, but just to have an understanding that we have Q, value, and chroma. And y'all remember that that is written as a 10YR56. So, what will be the Munsell notation for the square indicated on the left? What is the hue? 5YR. The value. 4 and a chroma 2. So that is... 5YR, chroma of 4, or value of 4, chroma of 2. How about this one? Seven point five Y R seven slash six. I 
รวมด้วยสักการ going to influence our、uh, soil color if we look right down here at this very bottom one so when you if you were to tell me that you had a 5 y r two and a half dash one and I looked at this soil I would think there's going to be some organic matter there organic matter being like the dark nasty stuff that's in the gutter when the leaves fall and they decompose it's the dark part but if you were to tell me that you had a 75 y r 7 dash 6 and you can't figure out why You can't figure out why you can't hold water. That looks like something you would see at the beach, right? That's probably why. That's one of the first things that we would look at and go, "Oh, you don't have any organic matter. Your CEC is probably low. Your water infiltration is high. You can't keep nutrients in the root zone, and that's why your plants are dying." Water content. That was the whole purpose of doing it dry and wet. So that you can see the change in color whenever you held it under the muscle chart, dry, and then wet. And so, if this, if we were to do this with this 7.5 y r, dry, when we added water, it might have shifted over here. They weren't too far off, but they also weren't the same. So the difference being, you added water, changed the color, it was activated. And then whether or not it's reduced or oxidized. And so you remember I showed you some of those really nasty, ugly colors. Like, oh, if you had that gray soil, um, anyone ever left soil in a bucket for a really long time that's been wet? Yeah. And then when you scoop a handful out, you go to empty it. Like, oh, oh. That's because it's been reduced. There's no oxygen flowing through there. And so that's going to change the color of the soil. And you might see something like this. And so on the left, we have organic soils.、Um, it's going to have some、uh, that dark color. There might be some plant fibers in there. You can see that there's some decomposing plant material. And then on the right,、uh, the difference between the gray and the red areas. And so the red areas, you would see that there's iron. And so when iron is left outside, what happens to it? It rusts, and that is. Because it becomes wet and there's oxygen. So oxidized and reduced. Reduced going to be gray. Oxidized going to be red. Rust. It has to be oxygen in order for that rust to happen. Those those chemical reactions that go on that cause that red color. All right. That's all I got. That's going to end the notes that you will need to study for the quiz and also for the test.、Um, the test will likely open up on Saturday morning, and you will have until 11:30 the next night to complete it.、Um, I'll be posting more about that in the coming days. All right. If you have any questions, email me, and we will see you in lab today.